Can we read minds? For those of you who follow the media around neuroscience, it certainly seems like it. You've seen articles and heard things about mind reading. So what is it? Could we run mind reading in airports so that we know who is carrying a bomb or hatching a plot? Where are we right now with this technology? How close or far are we from being able to know if you were thinking about some particular thing you did or intend to do? Welcome to Inner Cosmos. I'm David Eagleman, a neuroscientist at Stanford. And this podcast is all about the intersection of brain science with our lives, both now and in the future. Today's episode is about mind reading. What does it mean? Where are we with it now? Will we be able to read your mind by measuring something from your brain? So strap in for a wild ride today. So imagine this, 20 years from now, you walk into the airport to take a flight across the nation, but there are no metal detectors here anymore or those scanners that rotate around you looking for things hidden on your body. Instead of simply knowing what you have on your body, you find the airport now has portable brain scanning such that the authorities can tell who is thinking about bringing a bomb onto the airplane. And don't picture a big clunky fMRI machine like we have now, because in two decades, brain scanning could certainly be done at a distance, getting some signature of brain activity of every person walking through. Now, could this work? I want to put aside any legal and ethical conundrums for just a moment because I want to ask, would this be technically possible? So let's start with, what do we mean by mind reading? This is a term that's always been talked about by magicians and FBI agents and forensic psychologists. And what it means historically is reading somebody's body language or the words they choose or their body posture to understand what might be going on inside their heads under the hood where you can't really see what's happening. And so the next step for mind reading is to use technology to allow us to do this a little bit better than an observant person would. And one example of this is the lie detector test. So I'm going to do a separate episode on lie detection. So I'll just say briefly here that lie detection is used in courts all over the world. It's not actually detecting a lie. It is simply detecting a stress response that is usually associated with lying. So this technology started in the early 1900s when people realized that often when somebody is lying, there's a stress response. You can detect when people are stressed about the lie. Now, this has been researched with breathing, blood pressure, heart rate, pupil dilation, and the most common measure is what's called the galvanic skin response. And all these are external signals that the person is stressed. Now, these aren't terrible measures, but they're not perfect either. And that's why they're accepted by some court systems and not by others. And they're not perfect because among other things, there are people that are very good at lying and it doesn't stress them out in any way to do so. And so a galvanic skin response or something else is not going to reveal anything about stress in their situation. So the point I just want to make here is there's actually quite a gap between the notion of a lie and something that you can read off the skin. And you can see this isn't exactly mind reading here, but it's something removed by a few degrees. So what about reading something directly from the brain? Just before I get into that, I'll just mention that some years ago, I talked with a startup that was using electroencephalography or EEG with little electrodes that you stick on the outside of the head. 
And this company's market was long distance truckers. And so what they did is they would sew these EEG electrodes into a baseball cap so that the trucker could wear the cap and the system could tell if he was getting sleepy. And if so, then the system would do things like alert the driver to pull over. So it was a pretty straightforward use case. But it turned out the company was having a very hard time getting traction for one main reason. The truckers were concerned that their bosses would be able to read their minds. Now, that struck me as interesting because we're never going to get very far in knowing what is happening inside a brain with a crude technology like EEG. People are using EEG to, let's say, control a wheelchair because you can find a few signals that can be reliably distinguished and then you can use one signal to mean go and another one to mean stop and left and right. But in today's discussion about reading minds, I want to ask if we can use technology to really level up, not simply, is somebody having a stress response or can we distinguish four signals to direct a wheelchair? But instead, what precisely is this person thinking about? Could we do mind reading via more direct measurements of the brain and how close are we to that right now? Now, what I'm going to tell you about the field that the media typically calls mind reading started getting the foundations laid in the 1950s when people first started measuring signals from the brain. And what they found is that these brain signals were well correlated with things in the outside world. So, for example, when someone sees a horizontal line, that activates particular neurons that makes them pop off in the visual cortex. So, in theory, if you had an electrode dunked into the visual cortex and you didn't know what the person was seeing, but then you saw these cells pop off, you could know that they were seeing a horizontal line. This is a very crude form of mind reading. Now, with almost everyone on the planet, there are not electrodes in their brain. So how could you read something meaningful about their brain activity? So some decades ago, functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, burst onto the scene. And this technique allows you to non-invasively measure the activity across the whole brain. The problem is that it's really low resolution. So instead of knowing what individual neurons might be doing, you now can only see great big blobs that represent activity that covers hundreds of thousands or millions of neurons. So people didn't think that fMRI was going to be able to tell you much about the details of what someone was seeing, like exactly what kind of line or picture or video someone is watching. But some years ago, researchers in England and in America started doing some very cool analyses. And what they did is they looked at lots of visual inputs and they measured the corresponding outputs from the fMRI. So you show something and you measure the brain activity and then you do the next one and the next one. And what they found is that even though the individual blobs can't tell you much, if you look at the patterns of blobs with lots and lots of example inputs, you can then use machine learning here to help you. And you can start pulling out some pretty good correlations. You can start knowing what was presented visually just by looking at the details of this multi-blob output. And this really hit a new watermark in 2011 when Jack Gallant and his team at Berkeley did an amazing experiment. He had participants watch videos for hours and hours, and they measured each frame of the video and exactly how the brain responded. Tons and tons of input and output. And then they could show the participant a video and just by looking at the fMRI brain activity, these patterns of blobs, the researchers could crudely reconstruct what the video must have been that was being looked at. So they look at your brain activity and the computer reconstructs this must have been something like a bird flying from right to left across the screen. And the real video was an eagle flying from right to left across the screen. Or here's a reconstruction of a person talking or a whale breaching or whatever. And the original videos that were shown to the participants were really, really similar. 
It was extremely impressive, and I'd encourage you to watch their videos, which I've linked at eagleman.com slash podcast. Now, as you can imagine, the media started blowing up at this point, and everyone called this mind reading. And it's only gotten more impressive and fine-tuned from there. Now the computer also spits out the words, the concepts that are associated with the video while you're watching. And Gallant's team has reversed the machine learning to show maps of where concepts sit in the brain. So if it's the word marriage or job or dog or whatever, you can see which areas of the brain care about these concepts. Now, I want to note that the maps of concepts are slightly different for each participant, and I'm going to come back to this in a bit. But for now, I just want to emphasize how mind-blowing this all is. And when I first read this paper about reconstructing videos in 2011, I was so inspired and immediately had an idea in my lab to see if we could measure dreams, because dreams are simply activity in the primary visual cortex. Dreams are experienced as visual because there's activity in the visual part of your brain, and your brain interprets that as seeing. So even though your eyes are closed, you are having full, rich visual experience. So I figured we should be able to just measure that and then interview people about what they roughly saw in their dreams, Or perhaps we give them a couple of choices about scenes that might have appeared in their dream and see which one they pick. Anyway, I started this project, but before I could finish it, my colleagues in Japan, led by Yukiyasu Kamatani, published a beautiful paper on the same thing. His was the same approach as what Gallant had done at Berkeley. You gather a bunch of data about people watching videos in the fMRI, and then you use a machine learning model to do the neural decoding. Now, with dreaming, it's a little more difficult to know whether you're actually getting this right because the people have to wake up and tell you what they remember, and then you compare that to what you think you might have decoded. And of course, you can't know the exact timing of when they saw what. But nonetheless, this gave the rough start to a dream decoder that could tell you what you were dreaming about. And the same idea with figuring out what someone might have seen, you can do the same thing with what someone heard. This started in 2012 in the lab of Robert Knight, also at Berkeley, who showed that you could reconstruct what words a person was hearing by using surface electrodes right on the surface of the brain. This is called intracranial EEG or IEEG. So by presenting lots of spoken words to them and measuring the neural activity here, they could reconstruct which word a person was hearing. And a paper just came out in 2023 showing now that you can use even more sophisticated machine learning models to reconstruct the music that someone is listening to just from eavesdropping on the neural activity. You can figure out what the music must have been. And specifically, this new paper reconstructs Pink Floyd's song, Another Brick in the Wall. So they play the music to the person, and they look at all this up and down electrical activity on the surface of the cortex, and they can figure out the words of the song, and they can figure out all kinds of other information about the prosody of the music, the rhythm and intonation and stress and so on, and they can put this all together into a reconstruction of what the whole song must have been just from the neural activity. So I want you to notice one thing. This is a totally different measure than what the other labs did. This lab is using intracranial EEG, which gives you really fast, small signals, whereas fMRI gives really slow, large signals. But it doesn't matter. For a machine learning model, all you have to do is give lots of inputs and measure lots of outputs. And as long as the output is reliably correlated to that input, it doesn't really matter what the measuring device is. You can still look at the output and say, okay, look, this must have been the input. This must have been the video shown because it led to this pattern of activity in the fMRI. Or this must have been the music played because it led to this pattern of activity in the intracranial EEG. 
And you can take the same decoding approach with other parts of the brain too, not just to decode the input that someone must have seen or heard, but also to understand what the intention is for an output. In other words, how the brain wants to move the body. In other words, you can eavesdrop on the visual cortex to understand what's in front of someone's eyes or on the auditory cortex to understand what's piping into their ears. And in the same way, you can decode the signals from their motor system to understand how they're trying to move. And this is exactly what neuroscience is doing with people who are paralyzed. Typically, a person who is paralyzed has damage to their spinal cord such that the signals in their brain aren't able to plunge down the back and control the muscles. But their brain is still generating the signals it's just that the signals aren't getting to their final destination because of a broken roadway or a degenerated roadway. But the key is that their brain is still generating the signals just fine. So if you could listen to those signals in the motor cortex, could you exploit those to make the actions happen in the outside world? Yes. And this kind of incredible work has been happening for two decades now. It started when researchers at Emory University implanted a brain-computer interface into a locked-in patient named Johnny Ray, and this allowed him to control a computer cursor on the screen simply by imagining the movement. His motor cortex couldn't get the signals past a damaged spinal cord, but the implant could listen to those signals and pass along the message to a computer. And by 2006, there was a former football player named Matt Nagel who was paralyzed, and he was able to get a brain-computer interface, a little grid of almost 100 electrodes, implanted directly into his motor cortex. And that allowed him to control lights and open an email and play the video game Pong and draw circles on the screen. And that's mind reading. His brain imagined moving his muscles, which caused activity in his motor cortex. And the researchers measured that neural activity with the electrodes and crudely decoded that to figure out the intention. And by 2011, Andrew Schwartz and his colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh built a beautiful robotic arm and a woman who had become paralyzed could imagine making a movement with her arm and the robotic arm moves. Now, as I said, when you want to move your arm, the signals travel from your motor cortex down your spinal cord to your peripheral nerves and to your muscle fibers. So with this woman, the signals recorded from the brain just took a different route racing along wires connected to motors instead of neurons connected to muscles. In an interview, this woman said, I'd so much rather have my brain than my legs. Why did she say this? Because if you have the brain, you can read signals from it to make a robotic body do things. You can decode the activity in the brain. Now, in episode two, I talked about many of these examples and a lot more. And I pointed out that we shouldn't be surprised that we can figure out how to move robotic arms with our thoughts. It's the same process by which your brain learns to control your natural fleshy limbs. As a baby, you flailed your appendages around and you bit your toes and you grabbed your crib bars and you poked yourself in the eye and you turned yourself over. For years, you did that. And that's how your muscles learned to mind read the command center of the brain. Eventually, you could walk and run and do cartwheels and ice skate and so on because your brain generates the signals and the muscles do as commanded. And so the brain naturally reads from these systems and we can do so now artificially. So nowadays, you have people who are paralyzed successfully running brain-controlled electric wheelchairs. It's the same idea. You measure brain activity in some way, either with surface electrodes on the outside or with higher resolution, like electrodes on the surface of the brain or even with a grid of electrodes poked a little bit into the brain tissue. And you read what the motor intention is, like move forward or turn right, and you control the chair accordingly. And this sort of work is exploding. A few years ago, Stanford researchers implanted two little arrays of microelectrodes in a small part of the brain, the premotor cortex, in a person who was paralyzed. And then the person was able to do mind writing. 
which was turning the signals from the motor cortex into handwritten letters on the computer screen. So the person thinks about making the hand motions to write big letters, and then you see the letter get drawn on the computer screen. And the person can do about 90 characters a minute. And then just in August 2023, two amazing papers came out side by side in the journal Nature. And by the way, I'm linking all these papers at eagleman.com slash podcast. The first paper was from Stanford. They were working with a person with ALS. So this person had a growing paralysis and at this point couldn't speak understandably anymore. So the team put in two small electrode arrays. These are little tiny square grids of electrodes. They're small. They're like 3.2 millimeters on his side, way smaller than a penny. And they dunk these into an area just in front of the motor cortex, a premotor area called ventral area six. Okay, I'm going to skip all the details because the important part is that the researchers said, look, given these signals we're seeing, what is the probability of the sound the person is trying to say? And also, what are the statistics of the English language? And they combine those probabilities to figure out the most likely sequence of words the person is trying to say just by looking at signals in the brain. And it worked really well. If the person tried to say any one of 50 words, the computer got it right nine out of 10 times. And when the person trained up on a huge vocabulary of over 100,000 words, the computer got it right three out of four times. This is incredible because the person is not using his mouth, but only brain signals. And the researchers could decode those and hear the person talking with them. And as I said, at the exact same time that paper came out, a second paper in Nature came out from UC San Francisco and UC Berkeley. It was the same basic idea, but here they were using surface electrodes on the brain, this intracortical EEG. So imagine two post-it notes up against the surface of your brain. It sort of looks like that. Anyway, slightly different signals spread over sensory and motor cortex. And they worked with a woman who had had a brainstem stroke 18 years ago. And she can't speak and she can't type. So just imagine being able to think clearly but have no capacity for output. It's a nightmare right? So they were not only able to decode her words, what she was trying to say, but they were also able to decode what signals her brain was trying to send to her facial muscles. And they made an avatar on the screen that would speak her words and show her facial expressions. And this is so amazing because it's taking the signals that are hidden on the inside of the skull and surfacing these, exposing these, turning these into something we can understand on the outside and watch on the computer screen. So this certainly seems like the kind of thing we would want when we talk about mind reading. And I also want to say that the researchers and surgeons who are doing this are doing incredible pioneering work. But after we've lived with these mind-bending results for a while, it seems easy and obvious that this should be possible. We're finding these signals that are often complex and cover giant swaths of neurons, but you know that they're correlated with movements or pictures or sounds, and you simply throw machine learning at it to decode the relationship. And once you've read the brain signals and correlated them to their outputs, you can now figure out the intention. So, all this is amazing news about where we are right now. And if you were to drop off from this podcast now, you'd probably say, that we have achieved mind reading. But here comes the plot twist into act two. It seems like mind reading is here. And if you judged just from magazine and news articles, you would be certain that we're reading minds and that the next step is to read everyone's mind and their innermost thoughts. But I want to explain why we are actually quite distant from that. What I've been telling you about is brain reading, and it's amazing, but we should reserve the term mind reading for reading the contents of your mind, your thoughts. And as stunning as all that current research is, it's not reading thoughts. Why? Because unlike a 
picture or a piece of music or a decision about which way to go next, a real thought that crosses your mind can be a pretty different creature. Now, with everything I've told you so far, you might say, well, fine, it seems like reading someone's mind is just the next layer of resolution, like going from black and white TV to color TV. But I'm going to suggest that analogy is a false one, and we're going to unpack that now. So really take stock of the thoughts that you have in a day, their complexity and their weirdness. That'll allow you to understand whether and how we could really do mind reading. So the other day, I was driving on the highway and I glanced at a billboard and I really took stock of the three-second stream of thoughts in my head. It went something like this. Oh, there's the billboard again for that software company. Tommy first showed me that app six years ago. Or maybe it was seven years ago. Tommy's beard was so bushy, which looked unusual on such a young face. Whatever happened to him and that girl that he was dating? What was her name? Jackie? Jane? I wonder how Tommy's doing now. Ah, that reminds me. I need to send him an email because I think he sent me one a few weeks ago about a paper he wanted to co-author. Now, if you could read out that thought, that's what I would call mind reading, not what's the picture you're seeing or the sound you're hearing, but that kind of thought in all of its weirdness and richness. Now, you may be thinking, but wait, didn't I just hear about some other nature paper in 2023 that seems to do just that, reads people's thoughts? Sort of. My colleague Alex Huss at UT Austin and his grad student Jerry Tang did a wonderful piece of work. He used fMRI and married it to a large language model, GPT-1. They put people in the scanner and they had them listen over many days to 16 hours of storytelling podcasts like The Moth. So the researchers know the words that were said and they measure what's happening in the brain and they throw the AI model at it to get a clearer and clearer picture of what words cause activation in what areas. Then you have the person think about a little story. They say the words in their head like, quote, he was coming down a hill at me on a skateboard and he was going really fast and he stopped just in time. And you measure the brain activity and you sick the AI model on it to tell you what words were being thought of. Now, the way they use GPT-1 is to narrow down the word sequences by asking what words are most likely to come next. So you take all this noisy brain activity and you force it down a straight and narrow path that makes it sound sentency. So the decoder doesn't get all the words, but the idea, the hope, is that it gets the gist right. So does it? Well, sort of. It depends how loosely you're willing to interpret things. So for the sentence about the skateboard, that internally thought sentence again is, he was coming down a hill at me on a skateboard and he was going really fast and he stopped just in time. And the decoder comes up with, he couldn't get to me fast enough, he drove straight up into my lane and tried to ram me which is not really like the original sentence at all. But if you squint really hard, you could say the gist is similar. Or here's another example. The participant thought, quote, look for a message from my wife saying that she had changed her mind and that she was coming back. And the decoder translated this as, to see her for some reason, I thought she would come to me and say she misses me. So it's exciting stuff, but it's far from perfect for even a simple sentence. So let's return to this issue of whether you could tell if someone is trying to carry a bomb onto a flight. You might argue that even if the system is imperfect, you might be able to see something cooking under the surface about a bomb, and maybe that could get us close to mind reading. The problem, of course, is that lots of people in the airport are thinking about a bomb. For almost everybody, that's, I sure hope there's not a bomb on this plane. And certainly, if you know that your government in 20 years has perfected remote neuroimaging and is seeing if you're thinking about a bomb, then you can be guaranteed that everyone is going to be thinking of a bomb. It's like asking someone to not think of a yellow bird. As soon as I ask that, you can't help but to think about a yellow bird. 
The more you try not to, the more your brain is screaming off with yellow feathers. But what I want to make really clear is that the problem with mind reading is even far tougher than that. We need to recognize that our thoughts are much richer than sequences of words. When you really take into account all the color and emotion of our thoughtscape, most of it is beyond just the words. So really consider thoughts that you have. I'll give you another one of mine from the other day. I walked into a restaurant and I smelled a syrup being poured on a pancake. And that reminded me of the time that I was in the 10th grade and sat with my friend at the International House of Pancakes. I was wearing a striped sweater and my friend was in his Def Leppard concert t-shirt. And we had the thrill of being away from our parents and out on our own, just entering our teen years. And we were flirting with the waitress who had a German accent who was about seven years older than us. And she was kind enough to give us the illusion of flirting back, or so we thought at the time, but now a better interpretation would perhaps be that she just wanted a better tip. And I asked her to help me with a German vocabulary word that I was working on, and she got uncomfortable and wouldn't do it. And suddenly, I was seized with the suspicion that she wasn't actually German after all, but for some unimaginable reason had been pretending to be German. Was she in fact American or from somewhere else in Europe? What was her reason for telling us she was German and putting on that accent when she clearly didn't know how to speak the German language? Now that memory, that moment in time, involves territories all over my brain. The taste of the pancakes, the smell of the coffee, the sights and colors of the pancake house, the sound of my friend's fits of laughter, but also things that are more subtle, more difficult to simply read out. Like my interpretation then and now of the reasons behind her behavior, my feelings of doubt and skepticism, and for that matter, of a confused and unrequited pubescent crush and mystery. This is the type of thing that's not stored in any one blob in the brain. It's instead stored in a distributed fashion that covers all territories of the brain. And more importantly, it's not just words that I'm thinking of. Most of it is subtle events and emotions. And I have to actively work to translate them into words, to even communicate this memory on a podcast. But words is not how I experience it as it flits through my mind. And hence the challenge of reading out something like that. So despite the tremendous progress that's going on, I want us to retain this distinction between brain reading, guessing what video you're seeing or song you're hearing or word you want to say, and mind reading for reading out a rich internal experience of some thought or reminiscence or plan for the future. Now, you might say, okay, look, that's a tough problem to get the real stream of consciousness kind of thoughts, but this should become possible as we get better resolution in measuring the brain. So let's consider whether that challenge seems realistic. So one thing we might need would be a technology that could measure the tens to hundreds of little electrical spikes every second in every single one of the 86 billion neurons in the cortex in real time and record those results. Now, that might sound like a straightforward technology problem. And in this century, we're used to going out and solving big problems. But I want to be clear that this would make teraflops of data every minute. And that's a ton of data. But let's imagine that we flex all our technical muscles and figure out how to solve that. Amazing. But that's not actually the problem. The technical feat is just the warm-up problem. The fundamental problem is the interpretation. Let's say I handed you this file of the 86 billion neurons popping off for two seconds, and I told you this is a particular memory. So you're looking in great detail at a pattern, a swirl of billions of neurons. But imagine that I don't tell you if this was measured from Fred's brain or from Susie's brain. This exact pattern among the neurons would mean totally different things in different heads. Fred grew up in China and is thinking about the time that he climbed the tree and saw the panoramic view and his mother who suffered from anxiety, yelled at him because she was scared because she had lost her younger brother in an accident. While in Susie's brain, 
this pattern would mean something entirely different. She grew up in New Mexico, and for her, it would mean she's thinking about the time that she went on a hike and saw wild horses and got in trouble because her friend had parked his truck behind her mother's car, and her mother couldn't get out, and they had to run all the way down the mountain to move his truck. Now, how could such different memories have the same pattern of neurons? It's because who you are is determined by the exact wiring of your brain, which is determined by everything that has come in, all your memories and experiences of your life. Everything about your identity is stored in the particular configuration of your tens of billions of neurons and hundreds of trillions of connection. That's what makes you you. When you learned that a cloud is the same thing as fog, just at a different elevation, or you learned that Isaac Newton was into alchemy, or you learned that the Basenji breed of dog is from Africa and has a curled tail, this is all stored by changes in your network. That's what it means to learn something and to recall it later. It means your network has changed to store the information. And so as you go through life and you have your unique experiences, your brain gets wired up in a totally different way than someone else's, with the end result being that your enormous neural forest, your inner cosmos, is totally different than someone else's. And that means that if I measured neuron number 62,935 in your head, it would tell me little to nothing about what that neuron firing means in someone else's head. And this is, of course, what the researchers at Berkeley and Austin and Stanford find. To guess at the words that someone is trying to communicate, they have to train the model on each person individually. The AI model trained on one person's brain has no chance of reading another person's brain. So, to do any sort of meaningful mind reading, we would need to do what's called system identification. What is system identification? It's a process in engineering of figuring out the internal structure of a system by sending in inputs and looking at the outputs. Like if I hit this button, it beeps, and I hit that button and it boops, and so on through all the buttons and all the combinations, and I can get a pretty good idea of what the system must look like on the inside. You give lots of inputs, you look at all the outputs, and that's how you figure out the parameters of a control system or the dynamics of a physical system, or in this case, the structure of a neural network, a person's brain. The key is that if you want to do meaningful mind reading, you'd really have to know essentially everything about an individual person. So I want to note two things here. First, in a sense, this system identification is what long-term relationships are about. Let's say with a spouse, you see a person in lots of different situations, and in each you see how they react and how they handle things, and this is what it means to get to know someone well. But second, we can never do it with very high precision. For anyone who's been in long-term relationships, you know that even with years of experience, our models of another person are always impoverished. One of the things that I enjoy the most about being in a relationship with my spouse is to watch when she has a funny facial expression or stares at something unusual that I wouldn't have expected her to stare at and trying to figure out what in the world is going on inside her head. And like any person in a long-term relationship, I'll tell you that often I have no idea or I'll make a guess or have an assumption but I am almost certainly doomed to be incorrect. And this is an example of a more general issue that I've mentioned in other episodes, which is that all we have is our own internal model of the world, and we can never really know what's happening inside someone else's head. And so we make our guesses, and we say things to people like, oh, I know exactly how you feel. And we mean well when we say that, but we're always off in our assumptions. It is difficult or impossible to understand exactly how someone else is feeling. Why? It's because we've all had a history of years and years of deep experience in the world. Things that were scary to us or titillating or amazing or dumbfounding or attention grabbing. And all of these form pathways in the unspeakably large neural forest of our 
tens of billions of neurons and hundreds of trillions of connections. So when you zoom past the billboard on the highway, the one that made me think of my student and his beard and his girlfriend, whose name I couldn't remember, and the email that I owed him, you would have a totally different cascade of thoughts. Same visual input, totally different internal waterfall. And unless I knew really everything in your life, it would be impossible for me to decode your particular idiosyncratic stream of consciousness. Why? Because I'd be tasked with trying to get some sense of a neural system that is built from mind-boggling complexity that has been developing over years and decades of experience. Every single experience left its fingerprint in the deep forests of your brain. So while some general structures tend to be the same, like where your visual system is and how your temperature regulation works and the hormones that control your digestive system and so on, all the rest is shaped uniquely, which is what makes one person different from the next. As you have followed your thin trajectory of space and time from your parents to your hometown, to your relationships, your school friends, your sports, your tragedies, your successes, your heartbreaks, your life, that's what has led your brain to be unique. Now, you can get a graduate student in the lab to lie down in the brain scanner and you can show scene after scene to figure out the rough shape of their semantic network. In other words, which areas tend to be activated by which words or concepts. And this is what the labs at Berkeley and UT Austin and others do. But it's not at all clear how you would get something meaningful from a stranger in the airport whose brain you didn't already know in detail. Like, how could you know if that guy is thinking, I disagree with this political position, and so my goal is to murderously sneak a bomb onto the airplane? Now, I just want to be really clear about the assertion I'm making. This challenge we face is not a scientific challenge of programming better AI decoders. It's not a technical issue. Instead, it's about knowing you as an individual. We are never going to get to real rich mind reading unless we have something in the future that accompanies you and tracks every single experience you have from the time you're an infant. Every scary moment, every class you sat through, every conversation you had, every book you read, every movie you saw, every sexual encounter, this device would have to record everything you see and hear and experience. And then maybe we could combine that device's data with a sophisticated model of your genetics, or maybe combine that with a bunch of input-output system identification, and then maybe we'd be close. So you might think, fine, if we could actually record everything in someone's life, then we'd be able to do it that way. After all, you might point out, people in the near future might wear portable cameras every moment of their life. But really, the problem of system identification is even harder than that. And that's because your internal life isn't just predicated on your inputs and outputs. So the brain reading tasks that I told you about at the beginning the researchers know exactly what stimulus was presented and know exactly the brain signals that resulted. And that's what the AI is trained up on. But lots of things in our inside life don't come with a clear external input. For example, let's say our recording device detects that you meet with a friend at a cafe and it measures all the conversation and your corresponding brain signals. But it wouldn't know that you thought about that encounter later. You saw an analogy between something that was said during that conversation to something else in your life. Two weeks later, you have a tiny revelation about the behavior of your date back when you were a kid and went to the high school prom. So for many of the things screaming around in your internal cosmos, there's no external input. There's nothing to film. And this is true of most of your internal thoughtscape. You might see somebody sitting in the booth next to you, or you might walk through the shopping mall and you see different people and you think whatever you think about them, they're attractive, they're unattractive, they look like my friend from back home, they look sad, they look pleased, whatever. The challenge for training an input-output system like the ones in the research papers is that the overwhelming majority of your thoughts are private. You don't say your thoughts out loud. 
and no one from the outside ever knows what's going on in there. And therefore, a researcher trying to train up an AI model doesn't have the data to train the model with. You might walk down the street and think that person looks lost or that person has weird shoes and so on. But these are thoughts that you never express. So we can't suss out the input-output mapping. It's not just a matter of having sophisticated enough algorithms to measure and store and analyze the patterns. It's that the patterns are inherently unpredictable because we don't know what causes most of them and how those patterns lead to the next. And I just want to mention one more reason why mind reading won't be done in airports, not now and not in two centuries from now. You need the participants' cooperation to train up the decoder and to apply the decoder. If people didn't want to train up on this, they could think whatever random thing they wanted and mess up the whole process. So yet another reason why system identification will be difficult unless you want to be system identified. So, meaningful mind reading, reading the stream of consciousness, isn't going to happen in our lifetimes. Maybe some new kind of recording technology and brain reading loop will get developed in a thousand years from now. But this is not for us or our near-term descendants. Instead, we will continue to live in a world of mysterious strangers stuck inside their own skulls. Each person, the sole inhabitant of his or her internal world. So let's wrap up. There's been excitement and genuine, incredible progress, but this should be carefully distinguished as brain reading. When we read the brain patterns to know what a person is seeing or what music they're hearing or read the premotor cortex to understand what words they want to say, these are technological feats that would have blown the hair back of the best neuroscientists 50 years ago. But it's not mind reading. Mind reading would be an understanding of the universe of swirling thoughts, which is where we spend most of our lives. Just look at a person sitting at the bus stop or walking silently down the street or sitting at the library. Their minds are swirling with an internal world considering what they're going to do and what they're going to say and maybe reminiscing about the past or feeling regret over a possible present that could have been. It's not about the final output of what they're trying to say or the input of what's on their eyes or ears. It's much deeper than that. It's the entire rest of the brain beyond the little territories of input and output. To read the rest of that area, to read the private thoughts of a person, would require an individualized understanding, a system identification that would need to track essentially every event in their life and probe every single neural reaction and have some way to at least guess or impute what all the internal washing machine of thought is doing. We are centuries away from that. And in a sense, That's good news. It means that we can enjoy helping people who are mute express themselves, or a person who is paralyzed move a wheelchair or a robot or otherwise make things happen in the world. But happily, it also means that we retain, for the foreseeable, pretty distant future, the sanctity and privacy of the swirling galaxies in our inner cosmos. Go to eagleman.com slash podcast for more information and to find further reading and to see videos. Send me an email at podcast at eagleman.com with questions or discussion, and I'll be making mailbag podcasts to address those. Until next time, I'm David Eagleman, and this is Inner Cosmos.